It was when I came to to here, Manchester, in, in when the Department of Sociology was founded in sixty four, mm -hmm. and um, and and the sub department of sociology was going mm -hmm. to have to teach its own courses, mm -hmm. and the person who taught urban sociology was. Valdo Pons, mm -hmm. you'll remember of course. Yes, of course, and unfortunately when I arrived he, he uh, fell ill and mm -hmm. so um, must have been Max Glockman and, and Peter Worsley probably, mm -hmm. they said, Brian will you, will you teach the urban sociology course, you've just mm -hmm. graduated from Chicago. I said, well, I didn't do urban sociology <laughs> in Chicago, but it didn't matter because, didn't matter city, because sure. what, what I went to the library, got yeah. out all the books. But yes. that was the irony. Yeah. I learned about mm. the Chicago mm. School of Urban Sociology in Manchester, in Manchester <laughs> rather than, yeah. than in Chicago itself. But, yeah. that was, uh, but that was the way mm. into it. But that was it made yeah. also a sense because I was easy prey I don't think that's a good word for it, then to the more anthropological, mm. ethnographic approaches yeah. that, of course, mm. the Manchester School was famous mm. for. And, um, and you, know, you remember these, mm. the kind of seminars we used to have weekly, yeah. you know, in which everybody would discuss the latest findings mm. from field work, normally done mm. in exotic places that's like, right. yes. you know, yeah. Africa or the Middle mm. East, etc., etc. Mm. Mm. Intense discussions, analysis mm. of the data, mm. and it was very exciting. Right. So we went down one terribly cold mm. Christmas time to Mexico mm. City and were bowled over. Mexico mm. in 1962 when we mm. went down there was so beautiful, mm. so warm and you know and it was unpolluted then mm. because the traffic hadn't built up etc. Mm. So you saw the snow capped volcanoes etc. In addition to this they were ruled by a party called the Revolutionary Institutional Party right. which subsequently I found out was quite mm. what it seemed and but anyway it's, uh, it's it all seemed wonderful. Jill's friends were all these mm. left-wing academics and mm -hmm. you know and and artists etc. Mm. So it was a wonderful intellectual environment so mm. Sue and I said almost I'm joking, it would be great to get back to Mexico if mm. we could. And the chance came up mm. in yes, indeed, here yeah. in Manchester, yeah. you know, when an American anthropologist, uh, actually from Texas, mm. who was then head of the anthropology department mm. in Texas, but also head of the Institute of yeah. Latin American Studies, he was looking for European mm. social anthropologists mm. to join his yes, project. Yeah. And he, approached Max, mm. who is a great empire builder. Mm. Like over that. So, that, yeah. so he said, yes, yes I'll find mm. you somebody. Of course, none of my real anthropological colleagues were interested. No, because that's it's right. It's not Africa, it's not the mm. Middle East, mm. and it's a total new territory for British mm. anthropologists. Mm. So, um, but I heard about this and mm. volunteered, and um, Max was quite happy, provided mm. I read a whole list of anthropology <laughs> books yeah. and took tutorials from Paul Baxter. So, you know, to, so to me, you have to have that historical exactly, context because yes, yes, what was happening, yeah. the things I studied, mm. how people mm. coped in coming mm. to the city, mm. etc., mm. the nature of poverty, actually is different, mm. not simply because, you know, somehow people have evolved, they mm. tend to be the same in their strategy yeah, of survival, yeah. but they're doing it in a very different mm. historical context. Mm. And to have an awareness of that mm. helps you to look at what's happening now and say, mm. look, that mm. isn't some mm -hmm. eternal sociological truth. Mm -hmm. It's reflecting how people, you know, mm -hmm. make the most of what they can mm -hmm. in, in, in mm -hmm. a particular yeah. changing yeah, environment. Sure. Yeah. And so, so that, that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And just generally, you know, mm -hmm. getting a sense mm -hmm. of, of history and mm -hmm. therefore change mm -hmm. and the importance of, of culture in behavior mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, history very, very important. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other thing that went along with that then was that, that what I did get from here in those early years, and of course mm. you you know that well, was the much more the value of ethnography. Yes, very much so. Yes. That you know, that so you <coughs> so mm. sociology, some formal sociology, even quantitative sociology, mm. could be useful. And I mm. do use yeah. censuses and surveys, but yeah. at the same time, the meaning of things mm. is best brought out by case studies, mm. ethnographic case yeah. studies, to my mind. Now, we wanted to introduce a sociology of education mm. course into the department and, um, and Max somehow got a hear of it mm. and, um, and he called me aside after a seminar and he told me this story about Zulus, which I didn't understand, he said, he said, you know, so I can tell you a story about the Zulus. The Zulu chief, he sits there and he listens mm. and he gets information, he listens and the young Zulus there may be discontented and they're plotting, mm. but he does nothing. He just mm. listens and waits but there'll come the day when he'll get up and kill them all. 
He said, I want you to remember that. And he said, That's some this, <laughs> this idea of sociology of education is a non-starter. And his argument, and it was an interesting one, was, you see, mm. that if we kept on as a joint department or a single department adding courses, that means you couldn't give leave of absence mm. to your staff. Mm. The problem, one of the qualities of the, of, of the joint department and even of the single mm. departments mm. was they were relatively generous with leave. And if you've only got to run, say, mm. six or seven courses, then you then you've got um, then you only need mm. six or seven you know people to do it. Mm. And if you've got a department of seventeen or eighteen, you've got leeway there. Mm. I remember, you know, Max Gluckman, who mm. of course himself had once been a communist and you know mm. and, and quite radical in his view, mm. time being appalled by mm. this, these students who were uh, sort of. You know, <laughs> in revolt mm. he just could not understand it and he stormed in i think one time to the refractory to 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 cleanse the temple of, 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 of these students at one stage and so so everybody had to try to restrain him mm. and sort of mm. didn't get out of it and um no and it was it was a peculiar period i think for um mm. for sociologists especially ones who who were um you know, hierarchical in control the professors etc because mm. um it is also the period of the belief in, in democracy, mm -hmm. um, not quite student democracy in terms of mm -hmm. you know, assessment of courses, whatever it is, but certainly faculty having mm -hmm. a voice. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. as, as you remember in those mm -hmm. days, um, everybody signed a contract to the professor. Mm -hmm. That's right. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, the contract literally said, you will do what the professor tells you, etc. like that. So. The department and members of the department really didn't have much of a voice in appointments, mm -hmm. for example. Like, you know, the big contrast when I went to America was, you know, that everybody in a department and votes on, on an appointment. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's only the department mm -hmm. that decides on an appointment. Mm -hmm. with, with us at that stage, mm -hmm. the professor would be a member or professors with more than one. Mm -hmm. they, would, they would select two people from the department to join mm. them on the committee and select two people from outside the department mm. to join them on the committee. And, you know, and so, the, so this was going to be an, an area of contention, especially for Brazilians. In Manchester, come February, you're so fed up with not having seen the sun for God knows how many months that everybody gets depressed, almost suicidal. And so then we had this idea, Susan probably, because she's good for this, said, like, let's have a carnival party in our house. And so we'd have this carnival party and everybody would come and, you see, and stomp up and down and do samba and whatever else it is. And, yeah. You know, and everybody generally had a good yeah. time. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. The only time I remember I had slight doubts about it was the, was the, uh, the last one we ever did, which was the February of 86, the year I was leaving. So we had our house on sale. And everybody was in there, and wooden floors, <laughs> and pumping up and down. I could see them going up and down. I thought, oh my God, perhaps it's going to break, and this will destroy our ability to sell the house. So I rushed down to the basement, looked up, could see it moving, but everything seemed all right. So I calmed down and went up. But it was, no, it was a good time. Yes, they were very good times.